So, um, first of all, we're not paid actors. We actually work for Microsoft. And yes, we're here. I've been getting a lot of strange looks from you guys because of my t-shirt. And I, trust me, it's, it's fine. It's a different world now. Um, so we're here to tell you guys a story on how we started uh, on a journey to move SQL Server to other platforms. And this basically started back in 2015 when our executives decided that it would be a good idea to explore how to land SQL Server on other platforms. And Linux was obviously the natural first choice. So we did this using a technology using, uh, called SQL PAL, which is based on a project from Microsoft Research called Drawbridge. There's tons more, more information about this stuff out there, but we'll give you links and everything in the, uh, in the deck. So this is kind of how we went from, you know, this was basically the state of the world in 2016. We only ran on Intel processors. We only ran on Windows. We only supported officially uh, an application fabric, service fabric in Azure. And we could run on-prem on and on clouds, but we could only do so on virtual machines. And uh, when the decision was made to switch into other platforms, we by using SQL PAL, we enabled all of these following use cases now. We run on top of ARM, which I know may be a shocker to a lot of you. Well, the fact that we run on Linux is already a shocker to a lot of you. Um, we're naturally now able to run not just on Linux, but on Mac OS on top of Docker. So if you guys are Mac users, you can just download SQL Server uh, container and hack away. We also support multiple application fabrics, including Kubernetes, OpenShift, and uh, all the uh, Kubernetes offerings by the cloud providers, including our own AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service, the ones in Amazon and the, one in Google, and the ones in Google as well. And containers is something that we're really embracing fully. Right? Um, there's a new feature of SQL Server 2019 that's called Big Data Clusters that only runs on Kubernetes on Linux. We don't even have support for Kubernetes on Windows nodes yet. So it isn't that interesting for a change of mind on how we do things at Microsoft. We also support, support uh, secure enclaves. That's another technology. If you guys don't know what a secure enclave is, it's a secure area of memory, protected area of memory within your, uh, within your computer or computing node that ena enables you to perform uh, secure operations within that, that area so that no high-privileged user has access to them. SQL PAL also uses this. This is a screenshot of SQL PAL run, uh, I'm sorry, SQL Server running on ARM. We actually call this product Azure SQL Database Edge. So it's the same database engine as SQL Server, uh, the traditional SQL Server that we ship out there. It's just that it's packaged in a different way because we bundle a lot of, a lot of other things. And we tailor it to uh, uh, Edge use cases. So this was one of the first builds that we did for SQL Server on ARM. If you look at the date there, it's September 14 of 2018. And that's it right there. It's running on top of ARM64. So not only are we able to run on top of other platforms like Linux, but we're also enabling uh, switching into other instruction sets like ARM. And we do this by leveraging, guess what? LLVM. So we leverage a little bit of magic there. Uh, there's some bin binary translation sprinkled on top and uh, things just work. Uh, so if you wanna run SQL Server on a, on a Raspberry Pi, you're able to. So it's a very, very, very different world for us. Anyway. When we started exploring what it would take for us to move SQL Server to Linux, the first thing that came up was, well, what are the possible ways through which we could achieve this? And we thought, well, let's explore how, how much it would actually take us to get there. If we did a native port of SQL Server to Linux, it would take us five years. Right? We will still be working on this. We started this effort in early 2016. If we had started back then, we will still be working on it and we would have not released yet. It would have taken us five years to complete. Using SQL PAL, it only took us three weeks to get a working prototype. And that working prototype was enough to convince everyone around Microsoft that this was possible, and we, could, we could leverage this technology for this purpose. But not just that, that we can enable a whole lot of other things using this tech. The rest of the time that you know, we spent building SQL Server on Linux was basically to make sure that we had a mature product, something that we could release to our customers and they feel comfortable in, in using it. That last number that I have right there, that is as of three weeks ago, 25 million Docker pools. 
SQL Server is actually very, very popular in containers. Right? Uh, a lot of our customers are using, them, uh, using the containers on their CI CD pipelines. And we ourselves are using containers on our functional tests. So instead of spinning up VMs running Windows for SQL Server, that's actually a lengthy process. Even if you use tricks like VM images and snapshots and bring things up uh, from that and that sort of thing, that takes a lot more work than it actually takes to just spin up a container with the latest build from the build pipeline and just test our, run our millions of tests against that, that stuff. So it makes sense for us to use or leverage our own technology to make our building pro uh, build process a lot better. So um, that number, uh, 25 million Docker container pools, grows at about 60,000 pulls per day. So we're having a significant use, uh, uh, use base out there. So this is the secret sauce that enabled us to move uh, SQL Server from, from Windows on Linux. And again, it's not like we actually compile SQL Server for Linux. We compile SQL Server for Windows and then we package it on top of SQL Pile. And this is how we ship it so you can run it natively on Linux as if it were just a package or on a container by just doing a Docker pull on, on Linux today. So the architecture goes like this. From the top, you have applications that are running within a sandbox of sorts created by SQL Pile. Okay, you have the SQL Server process. Do you have some DLLs for every process? Service host is the one that actually handles services within Windows. We have an infrastructure around services on Windows. We run that stuff on, on, on within the SQL PAL sandbox as well. Then you have SQL PAL, which is a PE executable, right? It's actually running within Windows. So it really thinks that it's, it's that SQL Server really thinks that it's running under Windows. It's just, it's just happened that we're tricking it into, uh, into providing a Windows-like infrastructure within Linux itself. And so you can see how uh, SQL Pile actually makes something like 400 NT calls down to, um, down to Win32K Sys, which is another PE executable running, running within, within Linux. And then from there, there's about 50 calls that actually make it down to the Linux host extension, which is actually an ELF executable. So when you run SQL Server on Linux, the host extension is the first thing that kicks off right, and actually generates all this environment for SQL Server to run inside of. So it's a pretty neat uh, technology, but it also enables us to do a lot of really interesting things. For example, we built support for persistent memory on Linux. Right? So if you, if you guys are not familiar with it, it's basically sticks of RAM that actually persist your data in them. With persistent memory, um, you can do interesting things like avoiding the entire operating system stack for I.O. Right? And just keep the I.O. in user mode. So that's sort of one of the things that we take advantage of. Most of this stuff is running in user mode, hence why we are at this conference. For the use of PMAM, and specifically for persistent memory, we can actually perform mapping of the entire database set of database files that you place on a persistent memory device and only do MAM copy operations in user mode to access them. So the latency for those operations is extremely fast. It's extremely low, I should say. Anyway. Uh, just wanted to give you a brief introduction to the SQL Pile architecture, but I brought two really smart guys that are actually going to talk in depth about this stuff, make it a little more interesting for you guys, uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Brian now. Hello. So, Arjun has just painted like a pretty beautiful picture of like, oh, this is amazing technology, blah, 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 blah. So, the, how does it really work? It's really terrible. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things we have to do that are nasty and uh, complicated to get this to actually work. So like, think about how a normal Linux process works. So like time, for instance. Um, you have VDSO where like, you can go directly into get time from user mode via shared map page, right? Windows has the same thing. They have a user shared page that's mapped into every process. Um, you can get time, you can get all kinds of performance counters and it's like a, a strict known address. So now we have to have that same address mapped into every Linux process. And how do we plumb Linux time into this? Like we can't go load VD or call the VDSO straight from Windows, right? And it's pretty costly to go straight down to Linux every time, like from SQL Pal or from SQL Server. Imagine going through all these layers down to the host extension to get the current time, right? Something that's pretty often in SQL Server. So 
That's complicated. Time zones are also complicated. So Windows time zones are very different than how Linux time zones works. We have to map them. Uh, they're all stored in the registry. It's very complicated. Um, Windows manages memory, uh, different than Linux, so you can separately commit, you can separately reserve in Windows. There's not really a concept of that in Linux. So we actually had to build our own virtual memory manager. Eugene uh, built it um, inside SQL Pal. So it's kind of weird where, so these SQL, the SQL, SQL Server process and any other virtual process that runs inside SQL Pal, uh, it's running in one giant shared address space. So we have to manage that address space. So what if one of the processes dies? We have to make sure that we clean up any mapped memory, uh, unmap it, manage protections, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> uh, file systems are another interesting problem. Uh, no, I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so Linux uh, file systems are case sensitive. Windows file systems are not case sensitive. So if you break this assumption, lots of Windows paradigms don't work. So and now we have to go do case insensitive and sensitive lookup at the same time and go kind of try to figure out what the program is trying to do under the covers. Um, and so there's kind of this endless uh, stream of things we have to go think about and implement at the right layer um, at the right place. So. We actually have thunks that switch calling conventions. So PE has one calling convention, like where to put registers, right, and where arguments are expected to be. Uh, ELF has a different calling convention. So we have these thunks. So at that ABI layer, uh, we have these thunks that say, hey, switch from Linux calling convention to Windows calling convention. So if you're doing an up call, you switch it one way. If you're calling down, you switch it the other way, right? So those aren't extremely performant. Um, so we want to make sure we do those as uh, do as few of those as possible. And so we purposely kind of keep this layer very thin. We want to only expose things that are actually needed um, and are very important. Um, so we try to do as much as inside SQLPAL.dll, our version of the NT kernel uh, in user mode, um, and leave only like the strict, uh, actually required things that you can only implement via the Linux kernel API. So I'm going to go deep dive into some of the actual like meaty challenges um, after I gave you a small sampling of the uh, things we had to do. So one of the big problems that we have is asynchronous I.O. So SQL Server is a database, of course. Um, uh, most databases uh, rely on asynchronous I.O. Uh, SQL Server is no exception. So we actually have our own user mode scheduler inside SQL Server. So we have our own events. We have our own semaphores. We have our own mutex is pretty much everything, right? And so that entire user mode scheduler is tied very closely to how we do asynchronous I.O. Uh, via the Windows model. And so if you're not familiar with how synchronous via asynchronous uh, I.O. works, kind of the traditional model that you would do in like a blocking application is you'd issue an I.O. to the I.O. subsystem. Um, sorry. Uh, you'd issue the I.O., you wait for it to complete, and then you'd process the completion. Um, it's obviously not very scalable, not very performant, so most databases try to use a, a asynchronous I.O. model where you uh, batch as many requests as possible, you issue them all, and then uh, wait for them to complete in unison, and then process all those co completions as they come in. And you get a lot more throughput, a lot more scalability, and a lot more flexibility. So when we go try to map these um, primitives from Windows to Linux, the problem is that Windows has a common view uh, over asynchronous, uh, asynchronous I.O., whereas Linux really has no high performance abstraction over network and disk I.O. So people would probably think AIO, like that the glibc AIO is a solution, but in reality it's not really a solution because it has a lot of issues, it's very slow in our experience, and it has its own thread pool. Um, so we have a lot of threads in our process, and we don't want to add any additional overhead that we don't need. Um, so glibc AO was not a candidate for us. So of course Linux has epoll wait and IO get events for processing uh, completions. So epoll for network IO, IO get events for disk IO. And so there's a small caveat that this was circa 2016 when we were building this, so there's kind of some new stuff that I'll talk about later, but um, this was the kind of template at that time that we go by. And so Windows exposes a single mechanism um, called IO completion ports. And so via disk IO, via um, network IO, you can use 
kind of um, the same primitives to manage completions uh, abstractly of what actually issued them. So how do we model um, the Linux primitives to Windows IOCP? So there's actually multiple ways to use IO completion ports, but uh, one common pattern is that you have IO's bound to completion port, so you call these kind of extension uh, um, methods, uh, read file ex, write file ex, and then there's a socket version of Windows. WSA is WinSock, so Windows socket send, WinSocket receive. There's also crazy stuff like asynchronous accept um, in WinSock. And then so you would issue those IOs and then you'd, um, you can either wait on the completion port or you can call get queue completion status to so do a blocking call or a polling call to um, retrieve the completions and then you'd process, you process the completion packet and um, do whatever application specific logic you need. So when we were looking at this, one of the interesting things we saw was that get, com get queue completion status is kind of um, you can think about it as a, a polling mechanism, right? And so that kind of maps to um, epoll and IO get events. And so the nice thing about get queue completion status is that it exposes a timeout. So as long as we ir uh, honor that timeout, we can do whatever we want inside that call, right? We just have to make sure we could get, get back to when the application gave us the deadline, right? Um, so luckily, epoll await and IO get events both expo uh, expose timeout. So we can kind of say um, for this completion port, we know that it's actually bound internally to a socket or a network, uh, a network, a socket or a file descriptor, right? Um, so we know which one to call when we call get IO completion status, and we can use get IO completion status to actually pump them from um, the application. So when you call get queued, comp get <laughs> queued completion status will actually go honor that timeout, plumb the timeout all the way down into epoll or IO get events, and actually use that blocking call as a method to pump these IOs back up into your application and surface them that way. Um, so this is a general model that works very well for SQL, SQL Server or applications that, are, that use um, asynchronous IO heavily. It kind of breaks down though when you go to applications that, are, that use blocking IO. So like very simple programs. So we actually have, we use the same model, but we do it on background threads so that you don't actually have to use um, the IO completion API if you, your application doesn't. We'll still surface the IOs, but that's kind of an implementation detail and a, a caveat. So this works. Um, there's one complication though that gave us a lot of trouble. Um, so Windows has this thing called APCs. Uh, asynchronous procedure calls. And so when you say, hey, suspend that thread, uh, Windows will actually send an APC to that thread and then ask it to suspend itself. Um, you can suspend a thread, you can resume a thread, you can actually execute callbacks on a thread. So you can say, execute this uh, APC routine on this thread remotely. Um, and so this is a very common paradigm in Windows. Um, so we had to honor that as well. But what happens if you try to issue an APC and you're blocked with infinite weight inside epoll? So our, Linux, our Windows stuff doesn't know anything about the Linux user space. So how do we get that guy out of the weight? So we actually inject an event FD into every single one of our weights to make sure that we can wake it up externally. Um, so we can go process that APC and then go back down into the weight if we need to. So there's all kinds of little corner cases that you have to think about when you're modeling these Windows things in Linux. Um, so what will we do in the future maybe? So the uh, Jens at Facebook has been working on this awesome IOU ring technology. So it's a new syscall in Linux as of 5.1. And so you have uh, two ring buffers that are mapped in the user space. And so you have a submission queue and a completion queue. So without actually entering the kernel, you can go say, hey, I wanna do these IOs. And the kernel will go pull that ring buffer because um, they, their kernel maps it into your process, right? So you both have a view of the ring buffer. So it takes the submissions out, we'll go process them, and then you can go pull them without entering the kernel as well. So we can remove a whole bunch of context switches from our IO path. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to go play with it. Um, it's in relatively new kernels though, so it's not like we could use it in production everywhere yet, but it's interesting technology. So another problem we have is synchronization. So pretty much 
there's like one single paradigm for all synchronization primitive surfaced by the NT kernel, and that's a weight for multiple objects, or there's a variant of it called weight for a single object. So on Windows, practically everything is a weightable handle. So you have processes, you have events, you have mutexes, threads, semaphores, the list goes on. You can wait on all of these via this one API. Um, so there's no real direct corollary in Linux. There's kind of stuff that, like, if you squint, it kind of looks similar, or you could maybe model it, but the, when you go look at the details, it kind of breaks down. So we had to do a bunch of work to actually implement wait for multiple objects on top of Linux primitives. So we built this kind of class hierarchy um, where you have a thread, and every thread has a thread wait context. And so that thread weight context has a condition variable embedded in it. And so obviously it has a mutex uh, for that condition variable as well. And then it has a rate of the, an array of these weight infos. <clears throat> and so these weight infos are kind of the, the pair between the weightable object and the thread weight context. So when you go and start a weight, you'll pass in five handles. And so um, those handles will actually be backed by this abstract class called a weightable object. And so um, the thread weight context will go and queue itself into a weight queue that every weightable object has. And so when that weightable object becomes signaled, it'll go process the queue, and depending on what kind of object it is, so if it's an uh, auto reset event, it'll go take everybody that's waiting and then reset itself. Um, if it's a semaphore, like a counted semaphore, it might take one event, uh, one waiter. And so it'll go resume that waiter by calling back through the wait info to the thread wait context and then posting on that condition variable. And so you kind of have this very simple paradigm that lets you abstractly model wait for multiple uh, using just the primitive condition variable. Yeah. And so... For the future, um, there was a patch to the Linux kernel about June 2019 from the Wine people. And so they have a similar problem. Um, so they have an interesting idea where they could model uh, this problem using futexes. So if you expand the futex API in the kernel to allow to wait for multiple futexes, then you could model the same problem um, using Linux syscalls directly, pretty much. So if we did that, we could get rid of a bunch of our code, let the kernel do the heavy, heavy lifting, and yeah, it's a win. Um, so if you're really interested in how all the internals work, um, one of our colleagues, Bob Doerr, has this awesome blog where he um, goes through a bunch of internals, and then we have a, a blog that goes kind of high-level overview again um, that we posted when we released the project. So Eugene is going to talk to you about our debugging story. Hello. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that Brian did not mention uh, is how to debug that thing. Right? So as, uh, as Arginius told you, when we run SQL pull, contain, uh, SQL pull process, it is elf, uh, elf process. And Linux host extension which uh, directly interacts with Linux operating system is, is pure ELF process. And we can y use any debugger, GDB, LLDB, whatever, just to debug it. But that guy loads SQL PAL DLL, which we internally call library OS, LibOS, and this is PE binary. This is Windows binary. Uh, essentially, in, inside Linux host extension, we implemented PE binary parser, which reads file and uploads it exactly the same way as Windows kernel does. And now, on top of that sits SQL Server and tons of other DLLs like NTDLL, kernel-based DLL, and, whatever, and probably some other process as well. And all these guys, pretty much 99% of the code, if you, if, you, if you start counting the lines of the code, it will be that much. That's all in Windows format, in PE format. Of, co of course, we have PDB files for them, but what use of those PDB files if neither of Linux debugger uh, can, can deal with that? Um, so the compelling idea is to just launch, just have separate Windows, VM or com computer, and launch WinDBG on that. 
20BG is absolutely capable of dealing with P binaries and with PDB files, with everything. And so WinDBG will be able to give us insight into uh, that part of the system. But unfortunately, Windows, WinDBG has no way to connect to Linux machine and uh, to, uh, to break in into Linux process. Oh. <coughs> so and we have a chasm. And if we have a chasm, people usually build bridges. And so that's what we did. We created a program which is called DBG Bridge, Debugger Bridge. This is also, this is also Linux executable, which uses LLDB library, and that uh, using LLDB, LLDB class library, right? And uh, which can connect to SQL pulp process and, and can manipulate it. Or, or it either uses a live process or it can load core, core dump from the file system. Uh, that guy pretends that this is a remote debugger server for WinDBG. WinDBG has well-known protocol, I user debug services protocol, which talks over network and can uh, connect to um, Windows debugger running on different machine. So uh, LDBG bridge pretends to be uh, just normal Windows debugger service running on this machine and gives access to that part of the system. This is fine, but we want to debug both parts of the system. We want to debug both uh, SQL, uh, both P binaries, and we want to, to, to get insight into what Linux host extension is doing at the same time, because they, they tightly interact. Fortunately for us, WinDBG is extensible debugger, so we wrote, we wrote extension for that, for, for, for that guy, who directly connects to LLDB library, we have intermediate code here, and controls uh, this portion of the system. <laughs> now, <laughs> what, win, what Windows, what WinDBG needs to know about the process? Win, WinDBG, uh, it, it turned out that WinDBG has very, uh, very little, it needs very little to start debugging the process. It, ne it needs to be able to read memory, it needs to be able to write memory to set breakpoints. And it also needs to know about two lists. It needs to know about how many P binaries we loaded in the system and where they are. And it needs to know how many threads are there in the system and where we are. Uh, of course, LLDB library cannot, does not know that. But every time we load any P binary, we go to Linux host extension and tell, tell it, hey, please. Here is the file, ntdll.dll, please load into, into, into memory. At that time, Linux host extension says, ah, here, here, here is some module loaded, let me put it in the list. And the same thing happens when thread starts. Every thread, every thread in SQL PAL has four stacks. It has a normal Linux, uh, normal Linux stack where it starts executing. It's, it has Linux signal stack where it processes all signals, like SIGTRAP, SIGSIGV, whatever. It also has normal Windows stack where it executes Windows code, and it has Windows exception stack. Pretty much signal stack in Windows world. Uh, so <coughs> so every, every time thread starts uh, we, which belongs to that world, uh, it also goes through Linux host extension, and all those stacks are registered there in Linux host extension. And it also put, put, is, is put in the list. And now LLDB library can uh, examine the memory, can find those, uh, those data structures, and we can report them back to WinDBG. Uh, <coughs> now, WinDBG also has ability to stop or when we load a new module, or we launch a new thread, or we thread exits. To, to, to implement this functionality, uh, we just put breakpoints in Linux host extension. Every, every time a mo new module is created, we put breakpoint on, onto that function, and when breakpoint hits, uh, 
uh, with, with, <coughs> with top of the execution. Okay, and let me show some, uh, quickly show some demo for you. Got disconnected? I'm connecting to my machine in Redmond. Okay, here we are. So that debugger bridge is absolutely not an in, in interactive program. I'll start it once, and after that it just goes. Come on. Yes, yes here. I don't know if you see it. Uh, he, here, we st I, st I started that program. That helps. Actually, if you mark it, yeah, it really helps. Yeah, I, st I started the program. So you see DBG Bridge SH. That's shell script, which contains all the incantations, incantation. And it opens the core dump, which, which, uh, which I got in our lab. It's, it's real core dump. It's the bug I'm executing, uh, I'm investigating now. And after it started, it says, hey, if you want to connect me, go to Windows box and launch that command. After that, it just prints some warning messages that it did not like something. But that's it. And all the debugging going through, through WinDBG. This is WinDBG. And you see, WinDBG says, hey, there was thread created. That means we read the list of threads and tell WinDBG that the threat is created. WinDBG really thinks it's, it's it connected to live process. And the same thing goes for, for modules. It says modules loaded. And in WinDBG, we can just go and okay. just inspect memory here, inspect uh, locals. It, it's, but this is only for Windows part. Because if, if, we do, if we do stack here, say K, okay, it shows the stack ends, uh, okay, it's a, a little bit, stack, stack ends right here, the call stream right. That's the way how, how we, we tell Linux host extension, please take core dump, I'm, 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 I'm damaged beyond, but if we do, Bank here invoking the debugger extension. Now we see Linux stack here. And if we click on Linux frame, you see here, here is the Linux sources and where the execution is. Uh, the same way we, we can do, say, bank tail, and it gives me a list of, oh, that's probably a bad idea, There's about a couple of thousand of threads there. It gives me a uh, list of all threads which run in the system. And some of the threads are not visible to WinDBG. Some threads are launched specifically for host extension needs, and WinDBG, WinDBG cannot see them. But through that host extension, I see them, and I can also inspect the memory or whatever. And we also have commands to do this single step debugging, set breakpoints inside the Linux host extension using extensions. And we set breakpoints and do single step whatever process, uh, debugging in WinDBG world, in, in PE world using normal Windows commands. Pretty much if you single step through the program, uh, in WinDBG world, it will skip over the uh, Linux host extension calls. All right, guys. Questions? Hey, guys. <laughs> Any questions, guys? Right here. Hi. So, say I have an ARM desktop or a laptop. What's the actual path to run this on ARM? systems is it released yet i know you showed it so i believe it works but so yeah like i said before on arm this is a new product that's now called sql server it's called azure sql database edge we announced it at build it's not ga yet okay we have a private preview of it it's not going to be released the same way that we have released sql server for box it's going to be tied to an oem 
but for testing and validation and all these things and development, we're going to have containers available for it as well. We do have an EAP, so if you're interested, uh, you can search for uh, Azure SQL Database Edge EAP, and it will actually take you there. Early adoption program, that's what it means. Yeah. I can give you more information offline. Thank you. Good question. In the back. So with all of this increased abstraction layers to map between Windows constructs and Linux constructs, and SQL being a performance-based product, how do you guys overcome all of the additional latencies in this process? It seems like there's a lot of layers here. And I mean, if we're trying to query something in a reasonable amount of time, right, like this has to be fast. Right. So as you can imagine, this is a generic concern from our customers. Um, I can tell you that we have really smart people, not me, working on the product. Uh, and uh, we have basically established performance baselines for SQL Summer Linux, and uh, they're basically on par with, with Windows these days. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, one of our, one of our bosses thinks that we can go faster than Windows. We haven't gotten there yet. We're basically par on so same performance on Windows and Linux. Are those public metrics? Uh, pub, are those public published metrics? So you're going to see some TPCE. If they're not public out yet, there are some TPCH uh, benchmarks that we have comparing SQL Summer on Linux. Two SQL Server on Windows, that's fairly similar. And we're also going to have TPCE. If it hasn't been published yet, it will come out soon. Um, are there any use cases of SQL Server that are slower on Linux than on Windows? I can't think of any. So there have been regressions and bugs that we have fixed where, like I mentioned, time. So querying down the time path. So that user shared page um, that's mapped into every process and has a little bit that says, hey, can I go fast when I query time? Um, and so we weren't exposing that correctly. So you could query time in a loop um, on Windows versus Linux and it would be like 10 times slower on Linux, but that should be now resolved. So there are bugs, right? But most of them we can fix. Sorry, it's not a performance question. I'm just curious about IO, uh, IO your doings. So you've mentioned, I understand it's like a plans for the future. But then I guess you already more or less realize how can it work from the design perspective. And two most important parts there about, well, at least what I'm aware of, it's this balance between completion and submission queues. Uh, can a uh, skill server by itself already handle this situation, the balance between those two? So one will not, for example, oversaturate the system by just submission. Can uh, a skill server do this? Sure. So IO completion ports have a concept of parallelism. So you can say, how, how much parallelism do I have my IO completion port? Um, and there is internal rate limiting. Um, but yeah, it's something we have to design. We haven't thought about it fully yet. But um, the, the IO, IO model of C, uh, LibOS and SQL PAL is, um, it matches the pattern of uh, IO U-Ring pretty closely, where you go issue an async IO, and then you immediately pull it for completion, and then you can have this background guy that can complete it in the background. And so we're already having these dedicated pump threads. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, those guys can just go pump out of the U-Ring instead of the current APIs that they're yeah. using. Yeah, and then the second related question. It's also, well, there are some limitations. For example, the memory for those IO rings should be uh, lockable, so it's like up to I don't remember, there is some limit. Yeah. So there is also a good question how many of those rings you want to have. So any ideas, like per thread, per process? Sure. I mean, I don't have any numbers I'll talk okay. about. But there's a similar problem with uh, kernel AIO as well, right, where you can only have so many uh, kernel AIO uh, descriptors or whatever they're called um, in flight in the process. And so that's something with the manage as well right now. Um, okay, thanks. So, yeah. Any other questions, guys? One more question? All right, so I mean, the elephant in the room, you did mention wine. So why not ex just extend wine with the API calls, API calls that you needed? Sure. So there's a lot of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons was, um, so before SQL Server on Linux, Eugene and our boss worked on a research operating system inside Microsoft called Midori. And so Midori actually used the MSR research project drawbridge to get Windows compatibility on uh, Midori, because Midori didn't run normal Windows applications. Um, so he was pretty intimately familiar with the technology. We already knew it worked. It was proven. Um, and also, there's like licensing issues. There's 
we, we can make SQL PAL as optimized as we want for SQL Server rather than fork wine and do custom changes, and there's lots of reasons. Uh, another uh, reason is that, you know, uh, on the original uh, slide with architecture, there was Win32K CIS binary. We take it from Windows, unmodified. We patch it, we patch it, we remove privileged instruction it after we load it. But on disk it is unmodified. So we, we can keep in sync with new releases of Windows, really easy. We just grab new Win32 cases, new HTTPs, new, and with Wine, you, you, you have what you have, right? It's ad adoption of new APIs and security fixes, well, it's just different cadence. I think the GPL part is the most concerning one for us, for Wine, right? It's not well, really very also, friendly for commercial software. Mate, you, also, you also distribute Linux kernel, but anyway. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Brian, Eugene, and Arjunas. Yeah, thanks, guys.